Um, our last speaker is Jarosław Hadeslak, and he's working uh, with a wide, wide variety of methods like um, semi-parametric regression, functional data analysis, uh, and he's working on, on structured high-dimensional data, and he's working in many medical areas. Um, he's a professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics, and he's the Assistant Dean of Research Analytics at the Indiana University of... Uh, uh, of Public Health in Bloomington, USA. And currently he's also um, an adjunct professor at the University of Roslaw in Poland, which is uh, pretty well known here at Kasus. And uh, he graduated in biostatistics at the Harvard University in Cambridge, where he also did a postdoc. And uh, today he will be uh, talking about sport-related concussions and their relationship to head impact exposure. And yeah, I'm very much looking forward to this talk and uh, thank you for being here. So first of all, thank you for the invitation and thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, can, uh, can you please confirm that you can see my slides and then you can hear me? Yeah, I can see Great, the slides. Great, wonderful. So I won't repeat kind of the, uh, the first slide here. What I actually decided to do, I uh, kind of seeing the prior speakers, uh, I, I decided to expand my talk a bit. So I will get to my main topic, the title, this influence of head impact exposure on sport related concussions towards the end of my talk. But I really wanted to go into more kind of deeper area that I'm working on. And this is the area of wearable sensors. So, Basically what I, uh, a lot of my work uh, concentrates on wearable devices. So the kind of the more commercial ones, like, I don't know if you can see it like an Apple watch, but I also work on something. Uh, these are more professional devices. This is for example, Actigraph GT3X Plus. And I will talk about data collected from such devices in the first part of my talk. And then I will go to the head impact data in kind of later part of my talk. So uh, just recently we published a kind of an overview article on accelerometry data in health research. And this is, you can see there, are, there were many collaborators that, that, uh, that I worked with. And we published that in statistics and biosciences. It's more of a, uh, an overview on the challenges and opportunities in, in this area. So what is wearable computing? I, I think for this audience, I don't really have to introduce a lot, of, uh, a lot of the things that I will talk about, but just to be on the same page, uh, what we're working with are wearable and implantable devices, which, as I said, this might be kind of, we can wear them on our wrists, we can wear them on other kind of parts, the body, let's say the hip, the um, even the ankle, like other, wherever we can attach them. And when we talk about uh, head impact exposure, we'll see they can be also uh, included in the helmets of the, say, American football players. Now, why are we talking about this technology now? Why, why is it so kind of so important now? Well, these days, even though we might not <clears throat> want to, we might not uh, think about it much, but even carrying our smartphones with us, we already have such data collected on us. Now, we might not use it, we might check it from time to time, and it's, we might uh, be interested in the data or not, but the data are being collected. Now, Majority of us probably have seen like Apple Watch or Fitbit or other devices in the kind of bottom row here. The top row has more professional devices. When I say professional devices, these are devices used in, in research. So let's say in epidemiological research, in medical research. So you might notice the devices in the top row, they are not fancy. They don't have fancy displays. They don't uh, do maybe other things. They are designed to actually collect research grade data. Now, when I say implantable devices, 
Well, these days, the devices that uh, are used for, for example, to measure the, the kind of the insulin level or the blood glucose level are, are also becoming popular. So saying uh, diabetes research, instead of testing something every hour, every few hours, we can have pretty much continuous mo monitoring of our uh, glucose level. One device that I'm actually not showing here and I, I used on myself uh, as a part of the study was uh, measuring uh, blood alcohol level based on the perspiration. So basically the device would collect uh, data or would uh, be sensitive to the sweat that we, well, that we all kind of have. And from that uh, information from sweat was trying to derive information about the blood alcohol level. Now, with all this data, what can be some of the scientific questions we can ask? Now, the basic one is kind of physical activity and health. A lot of the work that I'm doing is uh, associated with, with the study of aging. So kind of how how does our physical activity change when we're aging? And the data that uh, I've been using in my research, it's coming from this developmental epidemiological cohort study. It's not very informative what the name means, but I I I'll go back to this data. Some of the colleagues I work with work on Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging, Women's Health Initiative, and the big study that was done in US it's, it's called MHANES National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, which also collected data from wearable devices. Now, usually what we see from such data might be, I mean, the, the most common thing we see is the number of steps. Even if we have an, an app on our iPhone or you know, any other smartphone, this is the basic thing that's kind of reported. There's also a number of calories burned, which <clears throat> maybe I'll make this comment, but since this will be posted on YouTube, I won't make a general statement, but I think we're still far away from getting the good number or good estimation of the number of calories burned. Now, of course, with any data, with any new type of data, we have, we have to deal with issues. And the major challenges we might have with this type of data is data size. The first data set that actually I got, this was a few years ago, actually I had to go very quickly to Amazon to buy a portable hard drive because the amount of data, and again, this was like eight years ago, was like a half a terabyte, which doesn't seem a lot these days. And with the data described in, in this workshop, that's, that's a small data set. For us at that time, it was a very large data set that you know, we couldn't even put on our laptops. So that's one, one, one challenge. Another is there's data are highly complex, they're heterogeneous. The data collection protocols are not standardized yet. So we'll have to deal with all of those issues. Now, in my area, I'm a biostatistician by training. I would consider myself a biostatistician, but in this area, actually many collaborations are needed because we can just work, we, we cannot just take data and extract something from the data. In order to, uh, to answer true scientific questions, the collaboration between epidemiologists, biostatisticians, clinicians, software engineers is truly needed here. Now I won't spend much time on, on, on this study. This study appeared now, it's already a long time ago, like six years ago, where some of the devices, and so you can see one of the problems of studying the devices is that they change so fast. Who does even remember iPhone like five or some of the devices here on this slide, they don't exist. Some companies don't exist. For example, Jawbone. But this was a simple study where, um, uh, the investigators here, they wanted to study how accurate the devices are. And it was a simple experiment that actually the participants in this experiment were supposed to walk 500 steps. 
And as you can see here for some, and I'm not advertising any devices. Again, these are devices from like 2014 and uh, both the software and the hardware has improved a lot. But you can see that even with such a simple experiment, getting to the exact number of the steps, which we knew was, which they knew is 500, it's, it, wasn't, it wasn't easy. I won't go really through that comment. So what we did at that time, and this was, uh, it's actually, it was filmed, I, I won't show it here. If somebody's interested in this movie, I'll, I'll be able to share it. But what we did, we said, okay, let's actually study those devices. So I had my former postdoc, who is now a faculty member at Johns Hopkins. He basically, he was sitting on a chair, he would walk certain distance, walk back. And we collected the data from such an experiment just to see for us what these data are. And let me just describe such data in a bit of a detail. So we, in, in my lab with my collaborators, we concentrate a lot on something called raw accelerometry data. These are data collected uh, from, a, we work with these professional devices. So for example, here's a Genie Active device. If we look at this data collected over 24 hours, it's very hard to see anything. Even if we zoom, zoom into an hour, it's still not easy to see. When we zoom into a minute, we can start seeing some patterns. So basically what this data are, we, in many, for many of those devices, we collect data at a frequency anywhere from like 30, 50 to maybe 100 Hertz in free orthogonal axis. So these devices these days, they are called triaxial accelerometers. And here, if we zoom in to like a minute of the data, we can see some patterns. I can tell you now, see if you, if you remember like the Matrix movies, there were those kind of numbers and letters going on the screen and somebody could see a pattern in them. I kind of have the same thing here with this accelerometry data. I can tell you between seconds, maybe 38 seconds and 60 seconds, here somebody was walking. There is this kind of almost clear uh, kind of semi-periodic pattern when the device uh, measuring acceleration is showing kind of some pattern here. Now, the bad thing here, I have to say, majority of research, such data, for example, from a minute, it's uh, uh, kind of accumulated and we get something called an activity count. But here from this data, we accumulate data collected like 50 times per second, 50 Hertz over 60 seconds and three axes. So 9,000 numbers were just reporting one number. So a lot of the stuff that we have done in our research, actually, we worked with this so-called rock serometry data on this micro scale. And this is what I'll concentrate in the next kind of few minutes on. So what we're able to do, we're kind of, we're able to detect walking. We're able to detect driving. We were analyzing kind of climbing stairs versus resting versus some other activities. And why do, do we do that? Well, walking is like the most common form of physical activity. And if we can understand more features of walking, we can start thinking about, can we, asso can we associate that with uh, different diseases? Can we associate this uh, of aspects of walking? Can we basically extract more information from this basic physical activity that pretty much all of us are doing? And can we associate those, uh, those aspects of walking with other uh, more both clinical and kind of subclinical conditions? So one of the things that we had to address here was this, I already mentioned this data heterogeneity. So for example, we have data from two individuals and they are performing, we knew they were performing walking and this is in the left panels. But if we just took this data and applied some more common statistical methods like smoothing or you know, so something that's commonly used, probably we would uh, not really be able to extract, first of all, that this was working, and second of all, what are the characteristics of working. So instead of, 
what we did, we concentrated on other aspects of this data. So for example, here for working on the level ground, and this was experiment that we did ourselves, we kind of, we used this data and we transformed this data into a frequency domain. And then we're extracting information from this data. So here, for example, we concentrated on differentiating between working downstairs and upstairs. And again, this is just sample data from one individual. Now, this is again in collaboration with my colleagues and this was a former uh, student actually of uh, Dr. Bogdan in Wrocław. And now she graduated from a, with her doctorate from Johns Hopkins, Marta Karaj. We use the data that I collected with my former PhD student, uh, Billy Fidel, and we segmented the data using um, an automated algorithm. This was published not so long ago in biostatistics. So one of the things here that we, that we did, as I said, we concentrated on the frequency, uh, on data in the frequency domain. This is in the left panels. And based on this frequency, we could kind of segment in an automatic way the each step from the working, working segments. Now, I mentioned this DECO study. This was collected by one of our collaborators at University of Pittsburgh. We're concentrating on, uh, in this study, the, the data were collected on elder individuals, the ages between 70 and 90. And here actually in this part, we, what we did, we wanted to detect something else. And this was a question that, that arose many times in our conversations with the, uh, with the investigators. It's like how much time actually individuals are sitting versus standing. Now, what we concentrate on is, and again, this is maybe biostatistical uh, bias <laughs> that we apply here. We want to uh, derive algorithms that are, uh, that they are not black box algorithms. So we want to extract features uh, which are meaningful, which we can explain, which when we talk to with our uh, clinical or epidemiological researchers that they are understood. So here we extracted two features from the data and this was actually I mean, almost too simplistic, but in this, uh, in the goal that we had here was again, detecting of sitting and standing. So basically the features that we extracted were a median acceleration in one of the axes and the standard deviation in short time intervals gained from one of the axes. So here, what you can see is we, we had data that were labeled. We can see that sitting or lying, it's indicated in these red dots. We might think that even a simple algorithm here can detect uh, this, these two activities. And actually we're pretty successful that in, in, in our algorithm, the, the detection, uh, we call this algorithm setup, was pretty good and it was much better than the state of the art used in the field called sedentary sphere denoted here by SS. Now let me skip over this macro scale analysis because I really want to cover the topic of head impact measures. How is that connected with the first part of the talk? Well, here, this is a study that I've been collaborating on for the past uh, seven years now. It's called CARE. We have a consortium, CARE Consortium, stands for Concussion Assessment, Research and Education. And this is a study spanning uh, 30 American colleges. And we got funded by Department of Defense in the US and the NCAA, which is the National Collegiate Association of uh, Academies. So we, we got by now about $100 million in funding to study concussions in, 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 in college sports. What I'll present today is uh, it's data coming from head impact measurements. 
and we'll look at the exposure in the American football players. These are again, these are college players. And we'll see how this data can be used to derive better models of uh, concussion risk of uh, basically concussions happening in football. Now, in addition to this, to this general grants that we got in this care consortium, I also, I, I, I have additional grant from NIH concentrating on brain imaging. And actually this head impact measurements, I also have a kind of a spin-off grant that hopefully I'll get funded. I got pretty good score from the, from the NIH. So just to give you an, an, an idea about this care consortium. So on the bottom, you see you know, 30 schools, 30 colleges, US colleges that are involved in the study. What I highlight in yellow here, this blue and yellow, these are the schools that I will show you the data from. And in those schools, we're actually collecting data from a uh, head impact, uh, from head impact. How are these data collected? In each helmet, there are six sensors that are kind of built in. And the data collected from these sensors are uh, transmitted like real life, like in real life to a device that's on the sidelines of every game that those players are participating in and every practice they participate in. Now, the kind of the smart thing here is that the manufacturers of uh, this equipment did, even though data are collected uh, continuously, well, it's the sampling here is at a thousand Hertz, but the data, even though they are collected, they are not all stored. This would be an enormous amount of data and it's both the transmission of the data and the recording of the data would take a lot of space, a lot of time. So instead what's being done, the data that are recorded are only about certain threshold of the, of the impact. So normally, like in a practice, the, these players can be in a practice for a few hours, but a few hours of this data, majority of the data would be not truly relevant to the head impacts. So only the data, and I'm showing this data here on the bottom, it's only the data over 40 milliseconds around the head impact are collected. This is the bottom left uh, uh, plot here. And from this data then, different uh, features can be extracted. So one of the features that's commonly extracted is so-called peak acceleration. So here, this red dot denotes the peak acceleration for this signal, for this green solid curve. And here, this peak acceleration was about 55 G, where G is the earth acceleration. Now, this is actually, I'm showing a screenshot of one of the R Shiny apps that uh, my student uh, have developed here. So here we're showing the data from one of the athletes. Here with this data is over two seasons. And this athlete actually got concussed, this red dot denotes the impact where uh, the concussion happened, okay? So, this is another app, our shiny app that we developed. We looked at all the impacts for a specific player. And we have here the directionality of the impact. Again, for the live presentation, I'm not showing the shiny apps. I'm just showing the screenshots from them. But basically here, what we can see, this app needs to actually sustain three concussions. And we see that the direction of the impact and also the, the magnitude of the impact here. So in this study, and this is a sub-study of, of a bigger study where we collect the data on about 50,000 athletes for now, here, the data that we're concentrating on are from about uh, 700. And I know when I say in Europe football players, this is not the football, this is American football. So we have about 1,100 football seasons for about 700,000 records, so 700,000 impacts. But I say only 84 concussions. This is bad for the study that we're doing. But of course, 
it's great for the players because we don't want them to get concussed. We are working on, you know, remediate the risks of concussion. But one of the things that, that has been of interest in the field is, is it the single impact that's causing the concussion or is actually the cumulative head impact exposure that at least influences, maybe not causes the concussion, but influences the risk of somebody getting concussed. So here, the, the topic from the title, this is kind of, I'm, I, I'll be addressing here. So basically what we're doing here, we're looking at here, just the number of impacts above certain threshold for the concussed athletes, they're on the left, in the left panel, and for the, their controls, and this is maybe going, maybe not truly to digital twins, but kind of setting the right kind of twin to the concussed athlete. <clears throat> and probably today I won't have enough time to discuss all the aspects of this data, but basically for, for the purpose of today, we're looking at the impacts that the concussed athletes sustained in the past two weeks before the concussion. And we are setting up a control set for them. Now, not to rely on a specific control set, we repeated this kind of matching of the controls to the cases a hundred times here. And what we're showing here in red is finally this functional data analytic result of the analysis of cumulative exposure. So we can see on the day of concussion, which is uh, the most right thing here, this red thing, it's, I would say, significantly above zero. But also we might notice kind of the seven days or a week before the concussion happened, there seems to be some association as well happening. These are preliminary results. So we're still writing up the manuscript Based on based on the uh, based on the analysis here, but again, the main question that we are addressing here is: Is this cumulative exposure influencing actually the risk of sustaining a concussion? So, before I finish, I would like to thank, of course, and you know, I would like to say that this was all my work, but these are collaborations that I developed over the years and. Many of the collaborators here that you will see are from Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and School of Public Health. So my former postdoc, uh, Dr. Jacek Urbanek, and I should add now, it's actually Dr. Marta Kara. She just defended a month ago. So she's not a PhD student anymore. Dr. Karin Ziponikov at Indiana University, where I am my former PhD student, Dr. Billy Fidel. A currently postdoc, my, my former postdoc at, at Indiana, now working at, at Harvard, Dr. Marcin Stronczkiewicz, a collaborator at University of Pittsburgh, Dr. Nancy Glean, and of course, care consortium investigators, Drs. McAllister, McRae, and Broglio. And thank you. Yes, thank you for um, for this very interesting talk uh, with at least uh, two pop cultural references. Um, so yeah, does the audience have have any questions? Yes, I think Damar was uh, was first. So go ahead. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I just have a maybe trivial question. Uh, maybe uh, is your data is already well aligned in time? I mean, I, I see that for the concussion data, but sometimes the data and functional data is not well aligned and you do some kind of pre-processing like time warping. But uh, is that applied here? Okay, thank you. So thank you for that question. Yes, with functional data, we often have problems with the alignments or at least challenge with the alignment. Here, the nice thing is the, the data are um, kind of instrument generated. So we have the exact times when the head impacts were happening. And one of the questions here, and this is something I hope to be exploring in my grant, actually, that's what I wrote. One of, one of the aims was, analyzing this data at different levels. So what I have shown, I have shown the data analyzed at the 
day level. So we know what day, what hour, and so on, the, the impacts were happening. So in that sense, the only thing here we have to decide on is the where do we set the time zero? So for our specific question, because we are interested in the concussions, we set the time zero at the presumed concussive event. And that can be discussed. This is something that it's actually fascinating because this is based on the, it's not like with, I don't know, with some events that we can associate exact time with the event. With the concussive event, it's a presumed concussive event. So this time, this still can be discussed, but otherwise the data are pretty well aligned because we know the practice times, the days, and, 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 and so on. Well, thank you. Okay, I think the uh, next one with the question was Mark Osata Bogdan. Um, so thank you, Jarek, for a very interesting talk. I just wanted to ask about uh, how far you go with a clinical application of accelerometry data. Like, um, I guess uh, they could be used for early diagnosis or for monitoring aging people. And um, what is the state of, our, of, of the art right now? So that's a great question, but probably I would need more than 10 minutes to really answer that. Let me let me just give maybe a few kind of highlights. I know uh, that this accelerometry data, the wearable data, it's getting actually into medical research at the pharma companies, which is, I mean, we can do a lot of work in academia, we can study, we can publish and so on, but my understanding is that this data are already making kind of medical or pharmaceutical impact. How? A few examples. Uh, it's not something I've been working uh, on, but uh, my colleagues at Hopkins, they've been working on recovery, let's say after heart surgery. So basically such a device is placed on somebody recovering and they have data collected on them before the surgery. And basically they are looking at the pattern of the physical activity after the surgery. So this is more observational, but I know such uh, observational data are now used to introduce uh, different interventions. So for example, interventions like, should we uh, uh, ask individuals to start moving more on the second, third day, maybe a week after the heart surgery? Okay, so this data provides uh, not a subjective, but an objective measure kind of how much physical activity is performed after, after an, uh, a surgery. Another thing, and this is more with elder populations, we are interested in how the physical activity, we know that physical activity is decreased. When we age, we, we do less of it. But now the question is how, is it uniformly throughout the day? Or is it maybe some times during the day that uh, this activity is, is decreased? And here, this large observational studies, for example, Enhance study, they already started to provide answers to that question. And as it happens, the activity as we age, it's not very different in the mornings, but the afternoons, the evenings, really this activity, the older we are, the less activity we do. So this is also informative for, for the future interventions where we might kind of tailor the interventions to the patterns that were discovered. Thank you. Thanks, Jarek. Thank you, very, very interesting. Um, so I think Justin was next with, with a question. Yes, um, very interesting talk. Thank you for that. Um, one of the things I, I've done a lot over the years and my research group has done has been uh, the development of statistical methods for analyzing uh, animal tracking and animal telemetry data. And so there are some obvious uh, parallels there. We also end up with triaxial accelerometry data and have uh, you know, similar goals in terms of extracting features from it. Um, 
one of the things that's a little bit different though is that it, it's um, we, we very often uh, have data where we, we don't have a lot of um, training data available and we don't know what the animal is actually doing. It's out there somewhere in the middle of nowhere and you get this uh, accel accelerometry time series and you'd very much like to know like was it walking, was it running, was it eating, mm -hmm. what was it doing? Um, I'm just wondering uh, to what extent the, the methods you use, the statistical methods you're using to extract features from those data require uh, good training data sets and, and, or, or, or to which they can just sort of do it automatically or automagically? Yeah, that's, a, that's a great question. I, so of course we have more, I mean, we are more accurate in the, in the lab experiments. And actually, with with the animal data, we also talk we also talk about the the data that we collect not in the lab, as in the wild data, which will it goes nicely with your animal data. But uh, so at least what uh, what our what my group what what my collaborators and I are doing it's we're more learning from in the lab data, but we don't really need training data to 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 have the algorithms in the wild. Of course, the classification accuracy will be lower, but then it really depends on the goal of the study. So for example, there are <clears throat> many walking detection algorithms out there and our algorithms probably are not as good as the ones based on, uh, I don't know, deep learning or you know more sophisticated methods. However, what we're able to do is let's say, we detect walking and then we extract features from walking, for example, cadence. This is something that we found to be associated actually with aging. You know, we, it, we don't know how many kind of meters per second the person is walking, right? Because we would need other data like GPS data or other sources of data, but we know how many steps per second they, uh, they make. So something like that is useful for the, again, associating that with other health outcomes. I know in your applications, you might be interested in something else, for example, uh, detecting how long, you know, the animal was running or, you know, what they do, what their activity patterns are, let's say, during the night. And something like that, I, if, you, if you would like, I would actually appreciate if we could connect offline because I've never worked with animal data, but you know, maybe we can apply the, our algorithms that we develop for humans you know, for animals and see, actually just recently, well, when was it? Yesterday, we got an um, article accepted when we're differentiating between walking and running, which might seem obvious, but it's not, it's not, I mean, we still had to do the work to truly to see how to, uh, how to say, well, this was walking, this was running. So with animal data, I think, well, I would be very interested to see, you know, how how this algorithm would work i i don't know what animals you are studying but i don't know foxes you know how you know how they are i, I mean their running is different from human running of course yeah i will, I will uh, definitely follow up with you uh offline I, I think there's a you know there's potentially a lot to talk about there and one of the challenges is that we you know we, we basically aggregate data across many different species in many different places in the world and many different types of devices that use different kinds of data compression and all, all those kinds of things. So it's, it's very challenging to um, develop uh, analytical methods that can handle the, all, all of those moving pieces and, and still you know, come away with uh, meaningful insights into what's going on behaviorally. But uh, I would be thrilled to find um, useful tools that uh, we could translate over from your research. So I'll, I will definitely follow up with you on that. Thank you. Great, great, thank you. Um, so I also have a question. So from, from, my, uh, from my, well, rather naive understanding of, of acceleration data, um, I, I imagine that, that identifying running or walking or also um, head impacts, um, th these are probably the, the most easy uh, features in these time series. Um, what's the future of these variables? So do you, do you think they can also be applied to, to more complex sports like ball sports or maybe people can improve their 
the dancing abilities or something? Yeah, it's, uh, I think the future is bright. The reason is that it's, uh, I, I even mentioned this device uh, measuring kind of blood alcohol level. And again, measuring, I put in quotation marks because it's still the device itself. It's, so I would say the advances are happening both on both sides, hardware and software. I, this is a, a <clears throat> kind of a story I tell. I used my iPhone in seven years ago to, as a GPS and I put it on the, on the dashboard in my car. When I got out of the car, I, I, I looked, I, I had like 33,000 steps that I did during a day when I primarily drove on me. I was like, what's going on? Basically the device was picking up the car vibrations and recording that as walking. Now, when I do it now, it doesn't do it. So the software improved a lot over the past few years. Now, what you said about, uh, no, I, it was a surprise to me uh, at first when I saw like soccer players, sorry, calling them soccer, the proper football players uh, from let's say European leagues, you know, when they were taking their shirts off, they were like, you know, those things on them. And then I'm like, oh yeah, these are, they're actually equipped with the devices collecting their data. It's, it's wearable, wearable device data, yes? So this is already used. This is, I, I mean, I, I haven't worked on such data, but this data are actually used. We have much, many more characteristics. Let's say this, how, how far did they run during the game or, you know, how many, I, I mean, I'm sure there's tons of data. I haven't explored that data yet, but I would be interested also in looking into something like that. Okay, thank you. I just saw that uh, Artur uh, raised his hand. Uh, yeah, thanks very much. Very fascinating talk. And I just realized you uh, mentioned uh, pharmaceutical industry essentially and use of this data, uh, you know, come in, come into sort of a real world, if you will, uh, domain or as it as quite often called in the pharmaceutical companies, it, uh, it's real world data. So, uh, and at the same time, uh, I couldn't help but, not, but notice that uh, you mentioned that a lot of this accelerometer data is quite noisy. Right, so the real world data is usually noisy in on its own, right? So to this sort of point, I'm, I'm curious, uh, do you think, let's say there is more noise right now, too much noise right now across all possible devices uh, to uh, collect data and make uh, conclusive uh sort of results or projections based on this real world data from accelerometry specifically across different devices or are we going to just pick up that some people are using apple watch and the others are using fitbit yeah so th that's a that's a great question but the i'll give you a statistical answer it depends it depends what what purpose we use this data for and what we are trying to extract if you ask me can i can any device kind of detect if somebody was putting their shirt on or if they were brushing teeth or something like that, I would be like, well, that might be hard. And this is not because of the noise in the data. This is more kind of how, what we extract from the data. However, it's like, I always like to look, what's the alternative? The alternative in physical activity data was giving somebody a questionnaire saying, okay, during last week, how much walking you have done? How much stair climbing? How often did you play tennis or something like that? So I would say the data from those devices for just general activity, it's much better. It's much more objective. The bigger problem that we have is, you know, I'm wearing my Apple Watch now. Well, I can take it off. I can put it aside for an hour or half an hour. Was I, was I sedentary or was I not wearing the device? This question is actually more important for those devices these days than, than the actual, the, the software, sorry, the hardware is actually pretty good already. I'm not sure how much more improvement we can do with the hardware. Software is improving continuously, but humans, that's the one aspect we cannot fix. We cannot fix the kind of the behavior of humans just, you know, missing data and you know, is it, how is it missing? Is it informative? Is it non-informative? I would say at this stage, this is more of a problem. I see, yeah, thanks very much. That's very insightful, thank you.
Okay, I don't see any more raised hands. Um, and I think yeah, we're nearly over with the, uh, with the workshop. So thank you again very, very much for, for being here with us.